I'm eager to start our second day, the morning session, where Theodore Alexandrov is going to share with us some of the exciting progress that his group has been making in the area of imaging mass spectrometry. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to join us in person, uh, but he's able to join us, uh, I believe, from EMBO uh, virtually, and they very much look forward to his presentation. So make sure you ask lots of questions and keep the meeting interactive. Um, cool. Thank you very much, Nikolai, for, for the introduction and also for the invitation. Um, it's I'm so unhappy that I can't be with you uh, like on site because I was looking so much for this conference to really present these results, but also to get your feedback, but definitely to learn uh, much more from, from all of you because so we are working in the field of single cell metabolomics and we're definitely learning a lot and getting a lot of experience, but also uh, help from all the work that has been published in the other single cell omics and definitely single cell proteomics, of course. So, um, but without further ado, I'll start. And um, if, if uh, I understood correctly, then the talk is about 30 minutes. And then of course there is discussion and I'm so much looking forward to your questions, ideas and the discussion itself. So um, my name is Theodore. I work at Emble Heidelberg here in Germany. And uh, since this month, I'm also a faculty at Bioinnovation Institute in Copenhagen, uh, which is an incubator where we're, uh, um, we're starting now to commercialize um, the uh, single cell metabolomics developments that we do in Heidelberg. So it's definitely there is there is a lot of interest, and we have a we we see a lot of potential in this topic. So, and uh, today I'll present how we can uh, at last for us we can do single cell metabolomics on relatively high throughput. So first, I'd like to present our team uh, to acknowledge and appreciate their, their work, but also to highlight the really the interdisciplinary work which is necessary to perform developments in this uh, uh, challenging space. And this is, here we have experts in biology and omics. Uh, here we have devoted uh, uh, experimentalists in mass spectrometry, which really make sure that the data we are collecting is reliable, but uh, top-notch, highest quality, highest sensitivity, of course. Then we have computer scientists uh, who make sense out of the data, develop new ideas, new algorithms. And we are also very fortunate to have several devoted software engineers who help with software for us, but also for the community. Now with this introduction, let me focus on what is our research interest and how it got crystallized over the past years. So it's actually on a metabolic cell state. And by now we know that uh, cells post differentiation, in particular through the tremendous uh, uh, developments, advances and results from single cell uh, omics, we know that there is definitely huge heterogeneity in level of cell types, but we're interested to look a bit further and really uh, 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 develop methods which help reveal this very dynamic uh, uh, metabolic uh, uh, state. And here definitely we know that it's managed and governed by DNA and cellular programs, but what's even more, is uh, we're interested in non effect of non-genetic factors, being it other cells, environment, and here you can think about local, say tumor microenvironment, but also global uh, environment, including pollution, but even, even climate change. So how pathogens affect and uh, reprogram metabolic cell state and how can we develop therapy that would capitalize on knowing uh, um, what is what metabolic st uh, state the cell is currently in. Here, definitely the technology of spatial and single cell metabolomics comes very desired and demanded to be able to reveal this information in the spatial context, uh, dissect the single cell heterogeneity and provide readouts on metabolomics, which is closest to the phenotype. But as we'll see later on, it also provides readouts, which are probably uh, uh, can be obtained in the fastest and cheapest way possible. We, how we do it? We use mass spectrometry, in particular imaging mass spectrometry, developing tools for computational biology, and also integrating them into the bigger context of AI and ML methods. So before I introduce our work, I would like to present you two uh, foundational technologies for us, and one is imaging mass spectrometry, and another is software platform Metaspace. So imaging mass spectrometry, for those uh, who didn't, across, didn't, uh, didn't come across it yet, is a laser-based technology coupled with mass spectrometry where we, we can take a tissue section here or cells on a glass light and then laser shoots 
at a particular location in a grid like pattern and then from every location that will become later a pixel the molecules get desorbed they capture it into mass spectrometer and then we produce an ms1 spectrum so and uh, after we collect a lot of spectra for a lot of pixels so we can uh, also select the particular m over z value and for m over z construct an ion image that will be representing relative intensities uh, of this ion of interest at all spatial locations and uh, if we perform a metabolic identification, we can assign structures, molecular structures to all these ions. And now we have truly molecular imaging. And the technology that we currently have uh, in our lab and also in Copenhagen, so um, produces data with a five to 10 micrometer pixel size, can detect about 100 small molecules or about 500 lipids, detects also drugs and drug metabolites, generates a lot of data, of course, because it's untargeted technology. And over the past 15 years, this became the major technology for spatial metabolomics. So just a, uh, an image how it can look like. If you put a tissue section into imaging mass spectrometer, you get data like this, where you can appreciate that it delivers the anatomic content. The spatial resolution is not yet on the microscopy level, but close to it. So we can detect molecules from different molecular classes in one shot. And this is just a few examples from the molecules that we can detect. Because as I uh, mentioned earlier, we detect about at least uh, at least 100 small molecules so much. So over the past decade, one of the key challenges in this field was metabolite identification. How can we find molecules which are encoded in this spectra? And here, I'm, I would like to present in two slides our uh, second foundational technology that we use later on for single cell analysis, which is metaspace. And Metaspace is an uh, engine, but also online platform uh, to perform metabolite identification for imaging mass spectrometry. We have published the protocol or a method. We have implemented it on the cloud. And now anyone can upload their data and get uh, molecules back in about uh, 10 minutes, molecules, images, and also sharing all this information, uh, organizing and visualizing and so on. And this is all uh, uh, public, uh, open source and free thanks to the funding from European Commission and National Institute of Health. So what's even more important that many users they started sharing their data publicly and thus creating metabolite imaging knowledge base, which helps us understand what is detectable, what is not. And by now, Metaspace became really a global platform, which is uh, used by more than 1,000 users from across the globe. And uh, uh, in the last three years, we started getting a lot of publications coming in where users, they really got a uh, uh, um, good use out of this platform. So now the question is, how can we perform uh, single cell metabolomics? Again, again, using imaging mass spectrometry and capitalizing on capacities provided by Metaspace. And here, I would like to present our developments that we published last year in spatial single cell metabolomics. Initially, this project started as the first PhD project in our team by Luca Rapas, supported by the second PhD student. And here we also teamed up uh, with uh, Matthias Heikenwelder, who is expert in NASH and immune oncology at German Cancer Research Center and PhD student Mira Stadler. So um, before I do this, I'd like to touch, uh, touch a little bit upon the state of the art in uh, single cell metabolomics, because um, if you go to, uh, um, I mean, I definitely will not go to extremely comprehensive state of the art, and there is a lot of experts also in, in, in the room, but what I'd like to um, make clear here that if you go to PubMed and if you pull all the publications on the logarithmic scale, you plot them here, the numbers, then you will see that uh, single cell metabolomics is definitely the youngest of all omics, in particular compared to say proteomics, but it's also exponentially developing technology. There is a lot of interest, there is a lot of publications. And five years ago, there were just a handful of labs. And uh, again, some of them, they are present, uh, present in the audience, but uh, just a handful of labs uh, performing uh, uh, technology development and applications. But it's really, really cool to see uh, the boost in these developments. And now there is so much, so, so, so much great work coming, coming out of, the, of this and other labs. So what's also interesting is that there is a lot of interest in, uh, in this field. In particular, last year, single cell metabolomics was recognized among top 10 emerging technologies in chemistry by IUPAC. And if you're interested to read a bit more on this, Nature Methods have published a um, technology feature last year where they discuss uh, this re-emerging interest in single-summit polemics because it actually started 
uh, more than a decade ago, but now I think it's really going through a revival of interest, but also developments and applications. And uh, they, they, dis they discuss and reflect here on the methods, but also on the applications. So with this very, very short introduction, I'd like to um, share our developments and uh, present our method SpaceM, which is a method for spatial single cell metabolomics. Again, spearheaded by Luca Rapes, but since then it completely changed the focus of research focus of our team and almost everyone now in our team works on single cell analysis. So here I'm showing you how it works on cells and this can be adherent cells or cells in suspension, which are plated or grown on a glass slide. Then in the first step, we do microscopy and we do it to find where the cells are to find their morphometric phenotype and also fluorescence phenotype if, in case we use any life uh, imaging stain, uh, staining or fluorescent proteins uh, reporters and so on. So once we, we have this information, we put exactly the same cells into an imaging mass spectrometer and we get these pixelated images, one image per, per ion, metabolic ion. And in order to find the, the metabolites which are hidden there, we run it through Metaspace. And this was completely a, 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 a game changer for us to really start working with molecular data and not with the spectra and also definitely to reduce the impact of all other confounders which come from background ions. Then Luca has figured out uh, how to overlay these two types of data with subcellular precision. And after normalization, we can assign uh, in metabolic intensities to individual cells. And this is truly single cell data, which can be represented as spatial molecular metrics, where for every cell, we have metabolic intensities, we have fluorescence staining, quantified, we have a morphometric property describing the shapes of the cells, and we also have spatial features, and definitely we also have images, microscopy images we can, we, we can go and pull and use for additional analysis. So in the first part of my, uh, now in the first application, I'd like to show you how we applied this technology to interrogating metabolic reprogramming in non-alcoholic steatohepatitis, which is an inflammatory stage of fatty liver disease and a common factor uh, towards um, fibrosis, uh, liver damage, and ultimately liver cancer. So here uh, we teamed up with uh, Matthias Heikenwelder, a PI, uh, a German, uh, German cancer research center here in Heidelberg and PhD student Mira Stadler. So what you're looking at here is um, um, human hepatocytes, DHEPRG, which are stimulated with uh, free fatty acids. And on top of this, they are stimulated with a pro-inflammatory cytokine here, TNF alpha. And if we stain these cells against lipid droplets with a here with LD540, which is neutral lipid staining, you see that some lipids they demonstrate so-called steatotic, uh, so -called steatotic uh, phenotype, where they accumulate so many lipid droplets they they're bloated uh, already in shape, uh, but definitely in the content. Also very interesting that um, we observe very strongly single cell heterogeneity, even in this isogenic population of cells. So it was a perfect model. And here we embarked uh, on a journey together with Matthias and Mira. And uh, here I'm showing you first results uh, from this, where we consider it controlled hepatocytes. We consider it also uh, hepatocytes stimulated with the free fatty acids alone. We see accumulation of lipid droplets, which gets even more pronounced when we add a pro-inflammatory cytokine he here, IL-17A. And on top of this, we, uh, for another um, uh, condition, we added TPCA1, which is small molecule inhibitor of nf B, to suppress the inflammation. And um, now we see that the phenotype of uh, cells changes. We see a reduction of lipid droplets, but we do not have molecular content. And this is what we did with, a, uh, with the method SpaceM. We put the cells into imaging mass spectrometry, into a SpaceM analysis. Here I'm showing you a single cell plot for uh, over 20,000 cells. And um, for every cell here, they, we collected more than 700 metabolites and lipids, and cells are organized here based on their similarity in these profiles. This is, uh, this is a, a so-called PAGA plot, which is similar to your map, which is, again, similar to in the conceptual uh, understanding to your PCA or principal component analysis. So if we color code now cells by the condition that we see that the profiles, they're indicative, and uh, they help discriminate stimulated from unstimulated cells. So also show the difference between the stimulations. What's even more interesting that if we now do clustering into three clusters, then we find that this cluster, which we define as catalytic state based on the markers shown later. In this cluster, we have not only red cells, that means model of Nash, but we also have 
a small percentage of yellow and blue cells. And blue cells, they are non-responders to the treatment. So again, they are the same condition here, but uh, the treatment uh, moved almost all of cells away from the state. So it worked, but there is a small percentage of non-responders. Non yellow cells are also interesting because yellow cells are those which were stimulated with free fatty acids alone. And now we see that small percentage of them, they really reprogram their metabolism to reside in this uh, normally associated with inflammation state. So and now this plot also provides us sort of like trajectory of change, metabolic change through these conditions. And even more, we can use this change as uh, to interpret metabolic mode of action of this specific anti-inflammatory treatment. We validated these results we, by finding solid time trajectory, by finding markers which are associated with each individual state, doing a lipid enrichment ontology and uh, lipid ontology enrichment. And now we find which classes of lipids and uh, uh, um, get uh, upregulated in, upon inflammation. So we also performed in vivo validation. Here on the left, you see data from single cell analysis. One pixel here is one cell. Here for the same markers, we show in vivo validation in the uh, lipidomics analysis of liver homogenates of mice with normal diet or Western diet, six months, which is early model of NASH. And you can already appreciate how well the results which are found in single cell analysis, they get uh, corroborated in in vivo situation. This was uh, very reassuring. And even more, when we looked in the literature, we found that these two specific lipids, they were reported as uh, uh, one of some of the most predictive markers in the human cohorts in the serum of uh, in the human serum. And uh, also these lipids, they are they often reported in the in the context of NASH and human. So altogether, this validation shows that um, the potential of using single cell models, but also single cell analysis to find markers which which have in vivo potential, but even potential, even maybe translational potential for NASH. So this is all published results. And with, with this, I'd like to wrap up the first application, the first part of my talk, which is definitely in this audience. I don't need to preach uh, that single cell revision is happening. And but we are very, very uh, happy and fortunate uh, to uh, contribute it with a methodological developments for single cell metabolomics and particular methods based on which can link phenotype and metabolism. And this is very, very interesting because we get this microscopy images per cell. And uh, so we can really interpret uh, what is what the cell represents, what is the phenotype of the cell, and get a, a lot of information that you normally get in microscopy and cell biology. It discriminates cell types, didn't show it, but it's in the paper. And it, what's even more important, how to discover and characterize much more subtle effects of metabolic states. So this is where we, uh, we, we, we were standing last year. And today, uh, I would I'm very happy and I would like to present you unpublished results on how can we increase the throughput and then show one application. So, and this has been tremendous uh, work by almost the whole team uh, to scale it up. And uh, you will see later why. So, but first let me touch upon why do we need high throughput and why, why do we need the increase in throughput and single summit blomics? Maybe we are already there. So there is a number of applications where we, we need a large N. And the, in biology, we would like to do perturbations to perturb our reductionist system in such a way so to get mechanistic insights. In medicine, definitely, when we start thinking about patient cohorts, the number increases by a lot. And in pharmacology, CRISPR or drug screens definitely produce a, lot, a number of conditions that we need to be able to analyze. So, but even more interesting, when we start doing it, we we'll realize that actually there is a lot of technical benefits. And the biggest may be, is minimizing batch effect. But there is also a lot of other things, which is actually provides more intuitive examina uh, examination, particularly visual one. It leads to higher consistency and also minimizes human error, which is unavoidable for large N. So, and what's very, very cool is that all this interest and uh, ambition is supported now with a uh, technological developments by others where multi-imaging mass spectrometry it actually really gets in faster and faster every year. So now we can really do experiments at a faster pace. Now let's have a look what's the bottlenecks we have in SpaceM. So previously we analyzed cells on the glass slides in eight well chambers set up shown here. And, um, and I mean, clearly we can put just eight, eight uh, samples, which is very limiting. And the throughput per cell was about three seconds per cell. And this is with the uh, imaging mass spectrometer 
which has about one hertz speed. But now there is uh, in, um, mass spectrometers which go much faster, about 20 hertz. So we, we definitely have a lot of support here from, from modern mass spectrometry. Long story short, we formulated the aims for our high throughput spacer method to first increase the number of wells per slide, but also implement in batch, batch data analysis. And I'll show you only the experimental part today because computation is a bit technical and specific to metabolomics. So what we did, and this is the work we, which was headed by our lab coordinator Shoraz and supported by our imaging uh, specialist Volker, they came up, came up with this solution, which is um, a plastic setup, which is fits perfectly to the glass lights and contains 64 microwells. And each microwell is three by three millimeter. It's absolutely compatible with glass light. Even more interesting, it's compatible with three, uh, three to four wells format. And uh, one can plate or one can even culture and stimulate and perturb cells in these wells. So on top of this, we created our custom laser etched glass lights in order to have visible sample IDs marked uh, as sample areas for multi imaging, high res fiducials, and, and, and uh, so it has a lot of benefits for us. Okay, now when we have this experimental setup and again, computational uh, analysis, I skip for now because it's, it's pretty technical. I would like to show you unpublished results on the pilot application where we studied metabolic remodeling of CD4 plus T cells. And this is the project uh, in, uh, led by PG student Luisa and supported heavily by Alex, uh, the data scientist and mass spectrometrist months. So, um, but first, what do we know about metabolic pre-programming of T cells? So we know that upon activation, they go from naive state to a factor, and here they switch from glycolysis, uh, from oxidative phosphorylation to glycolysis. And then later on, where a lot of cells die, but some small population stays, we have this uh, memory uh, uh, cells, which again switch back to oxidative phosphorylation. Okay. So um, how to study this? How, how many people do this? Um, one very, very uh, common assay is so-called sequence analysis, where the cells, they are stimulated with different uh, either um, here nutrients or inhibitors. And oligomycin is an inhibitor for respiration and 2-deoxyglucose or 2-DG is inhibitor for glycolysis. And then by measuring here acidification, you can really get bulk readout of how much lactate is secreted. And by this, you can get sort of a proxy for global analysis or bulk measure for how much say glycolytic capacity the cells have. So what we wanted to do, we wanted to do say seahorse-like uh, uh, experiment, but on single cell level. So Louisa came up with this experimental design where we take uh, human cells, T cells from, uh, from blood, from Red Cross, we isolate from PBMC's naive CD4 T cells. We check for, for quality, for viability, for purity, using the facts, um, but this is in parallel. So uh, then we stimulate cells with, um, with beads with anti CD3 and CD8, CD28. Now we have population of unstimulated, naive, and we have population of stimulated cells. And these are those which should actually switch to glycolysis. And now we can, because they have very fast metabolism, we can further uh, uh, perturb them or modulate them with inhibitors. And here is again inhibitor of glycolysis, and this is inhibitor of respiration. So we have these four conditions. So, and now we put these four conditions with a number of replicates into our high throughput space. And here I'd like to show you how imaging uh, mass spectrometry data looks like so that you get a little bit of feeling what kind of data we're getting. So here in the background, you see individual cells, which are stained here with the host, which is nuclear staining. And here on top, I overlaid uh, three different molecules, which were detected from individual cells. So then we put all this data in space M, and here I'm showing you single cell plot where one dot again is one cell. So we have about 20,000 cells here. They are in this orange in this space based on the simulation of the metabolic profiles, about 80 metabolites per cell. We have five replicates per condition. And now, so first of all, we see if we color code them by, by their condition that naive T cells, they're different from the rest, from the stimulators. Upon activation, again, with a, a CD3 and CD28 um, covered bits, we see that they change the metabolic profiles, which is expected. And what's even cooler, we see the change upon inhibition with the oligomycin. We see a lot of non-responders, but majority of cells respond. And we see a very strong shift 
metabolic shift of cells when we inhibit it, inhibit the glycolysis, which is again expected because we know that activated states, they reside in a very strong glycolytic state. What's even more important, we have this morphometric or phenotypic information. Now we can take microscopy information, we can plot it back here, and we see that as validation, the cells increase their size upon activation, which is expected. Which is, what is not really expected that upon uh, inhibition with oligomycin, they actually shrink and they change their size. So an effect which was not uh, widely reported in the literature, and we're now looking into this. Okay, now let me show you uh, one story. So, and this is about activation with a 2DG. So again, 2DG is 2-deoxyglucose, a known inhibitor of, um, of glycolysis. It works by uh, uh, getting phosphorylated, and then it inhibits uh, accumulation of uh, phosphorylated 2-deoxyglucose, inhibits the first step of glycolysis, which is a, uh, enzyme HK2. So now if we go to, to the data and we find the markers for this cluster, we find a lot of different molecules, and this would be a, a hexose, potentially glucose itself, accumulation, then froline, arginine, and different other molecules. And let me show you how we piece it together. So now if we, first of all, if we look at the literature, if we look what's going on on the metabolic level, if we inhibit um, a glycolysis with a 2DG, then one of the strongest marker reported is fructose 1,6-diphosphate or bisphosphate. There are also some other going down, but this is the strongest one. And this so-called like sentinel metabolite for, for glycolysis. If we now look in our data, what we see, we see accumulation of hexose, uh, likely glucose. We also see the drop of compared uh, from this part to this part. So uh, of fructose or hexose bisphosphate, which would be in line with this data and also drop in the uh, downstream metabolites. What's even more interesting is that we also detect a uh, phosphate of deoxyglucose per se, which is again inhibitor, but we supplemented a very high level about 10 millimolar. So, and in the literature, it was already reported that this is the, the strongest deoxy uh, uh, um, glucose uh, uh, metabolite accumulated in the cells. And this is what we see here. This is the strongest marker, which is accumulated upon this inhibition which shows the power of doing untargeted analysis. So I'm wrapping up my talk, but I'd like to show you uh, just one more slide, which is about uh, making sense of other metabolites. And here we're considering TCA, but also glutaminolysis, the metabolized glutamine and glutamate. So if we look at this uh, bar plots, they're actually from the literature from the bulk analysis. And now uh, showing here in, in green, I'm showing those which we detect, which actually in line with the bulk, glutamate, citric acid, uh, glutathione, GABA. So we see actually good correspondence between single cell analysis in, uh, and also bulk analysis. And now I'm making a story and validating it that it's actually glutaminolysis, which also gets increased upon uh, uh, inhibition of, of glycolysis. But this is still uh, yet to be validated. So with this, I'd like to wrap up the second part of my talk, which was about high throughput single cell metabolomics and also about um, application to T cells. So now we have the method which you can actually can scale it up a number of cells and perform batch data processing. And with a new mass pack, which is about uh, 10, 15 times faster in Copenhagen, we, we also plan to scale up all these experiments. So um, this method helps profile in particular metabolic repro reprogramming of T cells, which is actually very challenging because T cells are very small, about seven micrometer in uh, diameter in non-activated state. And we had a lot of troubles with them in the past. So in the future perspectives, definitely we need to uh, perform large evaluation and then it opens the road to larger studies. And now we're very happy to get a much faster image of mass spectrometry, which opens us uh, uh, the way also to, to do larger studies. With this, I'm wrapping up. So I uh, thank you so much for your attention, for the invitation. I'll be uh, very happy to get any questions, feedback. Um, sorry, I cannot be on site. So during the Q&A, but if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to reach out to me later on. I would like to acknowledge the work of lots of people in our team who contribute to this work. Sharaz, lab coordinator, Luisa, PJ student on T-cells, Andreas Falka, software developers, Alex, data scientist, Jeannie, Albert, Veronica, and others. Our collaborators at Emble, the KFZ, in particular Matthias Heikenwelder, and others, and definitely the funders. And, um, and thank you for, for your attention. 
And in case you are in the imaging mass spec field, we have a very nice position open in Copenhagen. Uh, so with this, I'll be very happy to take any questions and continue the discussion. Thank you very much for this nice talk. Are there any questions from the audience? I have at least half a dozen, uh, but let me start with a couple. Uh, so I wonder, what are your thoughts about the feasibility of analyzing labile metabolites such as NADH and about the variability in ionization efficiency from one cell to another cell? Yeah, yeah thank you for your question. Um, um, so, so first of all, about this uh, metabolites like NADH, which is, uh, there are a few challenges with them. So one challenge is that turnover rate is very, very fast. And um, there was, um, and this turnover rate is in particular enzymatic. So we need to pre prevent the enzymatic degradation. Here we do with fixation and desiccation of cells. This is one challenge. And the, the second challenge is indeed the ionization, uh, ionization efficiency. So, so far, we didn't have a lot of success with them. So, and um, there are groups who try to, uh, to improve ionization by doing so-called chemical deorization, but we haven't tried it on cells. That's why for us, those metabolites are a bit out of reach. So, um, and uh, ionization efficiency, I think this is, and in particular ionization separation, I think this is a very, very interesting question. And we are looking uh, very close into this. And we've got some preliminary results that we are going to publish very soon, where we think that we can compensate in metabolite specific way, we can compensate for ionization suppression in this data. So in this way to get in, uh, to get better quantitation, but this definitely only for those which, which we did act reliably. Mm -hmm. Great, very exciting. And just one more quick question. I want to leave time for other people as well. Uh, one thing that would be very exciting for me to see is measuring metabolic fluxes by pulse chase. And you might be able to do that perhaps. What's your thought? Do you think it's yeah. feasible? Sorry, can you please introduce yourself because your questions are really good. Uh, I, I'm Nikolai Slavov, sorry, I should have introduced you. Ah, sorry, sorry. Sorry, no, Nikolai, okay. I didn't learn your voice just yet. <laughs> and uh, I don't have, I don't, I mean, my video is very, very small. So, um, and then even if you are like so famous in this audience, if you can quickly introduce <laughs> yourself, I would strongly appreciate to follow up afterwards. Yeah, fluxes are very interesting, of course. Um, actually, just at the SMS uh, two weeks ago, we, we've shown a poster where we show that we can do flux analysis. Um, not exactly flux analysis, but isotope tracing, because uh, for flux analysis, you need to have very good quantitation and also pretty good coverage. But isotope, isotope tracing is possible because you can uh, theoretically get um, the same readouts that we're getting for metabolites, right? You just need to detect the, the labeled version of, of the molecules. So we've shown at the SMS and uh, that, and I'm happy to follow up and share this poster with anyone interested, so that we can trace the impact of uh, 13C labeled glucose through TCA and through acetyl-CoA into fatty acid synthesis. And uh, upon hypoxia or upon uh, knockdown of ACLY, which is an enzyme uh, transferring carbon from uh, citrate to acetyl -CoA. So uh, we show that there is reduction in the labeling in the expected fashion. So yes, this is actually, I think, super cool. And this is what, uh, in general, single cell metabolomics, but also imaging mass spectrometry can provide. Awesome. Thank you, Theodore. Any other questions in the audience? Okay. Hi, this is David Perlman from uh, Merck Exploratory Science Center. Thank you. Uh, really staggeringly wonderful results. Um, I wonder, um, with respect to the T cell work, um, we, we chatted about this a little bit before, but uh, how deep into immunology are you uh, able to get, for example, to examine other T cell states such as exhaustion or even, um, you know, T cell um, antigen presenting cell engagement with different, different antigens? Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you, David. I, I have it on my plan to, to follow up with you. And, uh, and so we, um, the questions that you brought up are extremely interesting because exhaustion 
seems to be linked to metabolism and definitely engagement with antigen producing cells as well. So, um, so we didn't look at this just yet. So I can quickly mention the few projects that we are working on. So uh, we work on T cells, and this is uh, this one, but also testing a variety of uh, small molecule um, metabolic modulators. And also we are looking into, uh, um, so in, in the bigger project, we are looking into a CRISPR analysis, which modulates immune uh, variants, which, which come from immune, immune diseases, GVAS variants. So this is um, kind of like metabolic effects of uh, CRISPR modulation of human variants. This is, but it's a bit different what you're, what you're saying. We are looking also into T-Rex, in particular in, induced T-Rex. I think this is uh, uh, very interesting. And there we look at, at reprogramming of lipid metabolism. Exhaustion is one very, very uh, cool direction. And we are actually, uh, we're now establishing collaboration on this uh, because I do believe that this potentially one of the most interesting applied questions in the immunometabolism where metabolomics can have an impact to first of all, help profile, help understand exhaustion, but maybe also uh, uh, help uh, find uh, uh, some, some therapies or modulations which revert at least the metabolic effects of exhaustion. Mm -hmm. Thank you, let's work together. Okay, there have been some questions on Zoom, so, oh, sorry. Hi, Boriana from Boston Children's. Really great talk, very exciting. Um, I have more, maybe a naive question because not so familiar with Maldi, but is it possible to measure um, like mixed labeled and unlabeled populations of cells to make sure that whatever you measure is coming from biology and not from a contamination or something else? And particularly, I wonder, I wonder from the metabolites that you report, how many of unknowns do you have to deal with? Mm -hmm. um, answering the first question, yes, we were also concerned, uh, in particular, whether we have single cell information coming from this method. In the paper, we do exactly this. We take uh, two cell types and actually inspired by single cell transcriptomics, where you know you mix uh, cells normally from two organisms, and then you see whether single cell transcriptomics can um, differentiate these populations. So we did similar, but with a spatial twist where we took uh, HeLa and NIH 3T3 cells, which is HeLa, of course, you know, and NIH, this is human fibroblasts. So, and then we, um, for each of them, we had a uh, fluorescent reporter, either GFP or Cherry, and we've shown that we can uh, uh, predict the cell type with accuracy higher than 90%. So this is in terms of labeling of like fluorescently labeling, and then in terms of um, isotopic labeling, we actually did similar stuff. And this was at in our ASMS poster where we took cells. Uh, some of them, they were cultured in, um, in, um, in normoxia and other um, in hypoxia. Yes, they both uh, were labeled uh, with a 13C glucose as a source, in particular 13C. And then we had also fluorescent freed out for them to discriminate and we could show that by even labeling in terms of 13C labeling also helps uh, to recognize the, the source of the cells. Uh, this is with respect to your first question. And the second question was, sorry. Second question was about um, how many unknowns do you have to deal with? Uh, yes, 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 of course. Um, that's a very good question. So because what I've presented that we can detect about 80 metabolites uh, at least like aging device we did that in these T cells. And, um, but our spectrum is about uh, 10,000 peaks for every pixel. So it definitely contains more information that we now are able to confidently annotate using Metaspace. So whether these peaks, they represent um, ions formed in different ways because in, in multi-image mass spectrometry, ions are formed and in metabolomics in general. Ions are formed not only by, say, protonation or deprotonation, right? In protonomics, you are, you are a bit lucky having just protonation. So in our case, we have deprotonation, we have chlorination, we have losses like water loss or any other CH2 losses, so which we need to account for. And on top of this, we also have in-source fragmentation. So whether they come from um, 
this sort of processes and uh, ionization pathways from known metabolites or something that we so far were not able to uh, annotate. This is still to be seen. So in parallel, what we're doing, so we actually soon be, will be releasing machine learning based version of Metaspace, which is for spatial metabolites, but we use it here as well. And uh, using that machine learning based annotation, we were able to annotate more metabolites and variety of data sets. So we hope that once we start using for single cell metabolites, we also can find more molecules. But still, still, it may be like from 80 to say maybe 100, or sometimes maybe a bit more. And uh, there is definitely a lot, a lot of unexplained peaks that we detect. Are there any more questions on the on the Zoom channel? Um, if you like to, you can unmute yourself and ask it in person. Otherwise, I can read it out. So there has been one question from Stella Kutsuli um, concerning the first study, where you perhaps able to integrate other omics data, such as single cell RNA seq or other proteomics to check for the expression of abundances of certain lipases that might be responsible for the lipid markers between the two conditions, particularly for the in vivo results. Yeah, yeah, thanks, so. Al. Um, this is very exciting because we definitely understand the limitations of metabolomics. It's a great readout. It's, again, very fast and cheap to get, but we're missing a lot of information on other omics layers. So we are looking into this. We have a number of projects where we try to combine this with either um, not necessarily transcriptomics, because this is tricky, uh, but more like RNA imaging, at least for a set of the, um, targeted fashion for a set of genes, or using immunofluorescence. There is a number of challenges uh, there. One of the challenges is that if we do it prior to MALD imaging, then we have uh, a good chance to uh, compromise the membrane integrity and also potentially lose some integral soluble uh, metabolites, such as small molecules. For lipids, it's, it's a bit easier. So doing it after MALD is possible, and we are looking into a few options uh, for this, but we, we don't have uh, results just yet. We, um, we had another poster on at AGBT, which was, I believe, last week, which is a big genomics conference, where we com um, combined spatial metabolomics and spatial transcriptomics and spatial metabolomics were done by, um, by MALD imaging, and spatial transcriptomics were done on consecutive section. So again, this is not for cells, but for two consecutive sections. And we did it in, in collaboration with the company Resolve Biosciences, which have sort of MERFISH, which is multiplex RNA fish approach. So in there, we were able to co-register this uh, optical images from each section, co-register them, and do single cell um, segmentation. And uh, although our imaging mass spectrometry doesn't provide the single cell readouts in tissues yet, because the limitations of spatial resolution, we were able still to annotate the cell types and find metabolites which are specific to the cell types and also association between metabolites and genes. But this is already like pilot study. And again, this is in tissues and this is because there you can do consecutive sections. In, in cells, we do not have results yet. Okay, thank you very much. Can we take one more question or what do you think? Okay. Um, yeah, thank you very much for a nice talk. Um, and I'm sure if anybody has any more questions, they can reach out to you.